I am just delighted to be here with all of you. First of all, because it's fast, which is near and dear to my heart. Allison, thank you. It's been amazing to work with you for so long. Um, but second of all, this is my first in-person conference since the pandemic, and it's just great to be non-virtual, to be here with people, to hear about our research and what we're doing. And I have to beg your forgiveness. The one thing that I'm very rusty on is packing, and I did not pack my fancy shoes, so please forgive the flip-flops. <laughs> I am a California girl, after all. Okay, so we are going to talk about um, the platforms for stem cell and gene therapy. I just want to make sure that everybody really understands um, what these are, what it looks like, what we're doing, and how we're trying to move forward um, to help the, the uh, angels. So we're at a very important point right now. The fields of um, stem cells, immunotherapy, gene therapy, gene editing, and regenerative medicine are actively changing healthcare. We have a lot of clinical trials ongoing, and we have approved um, therapies now, which means that insurance will fully reimburse them. They can be prescribed. So these new frontiers involve um, living medicines. So these are cells, modified viruses that only do good, not evil, <laughs> and other complex products that are not pills, they're not um, you know, a vial on a shelf, they're, they're stored in the deep freeze and we have to bring them back, back to um, activity before we administer them. So we need um, specialized facilities, a high degree of teamwork and expertise to manufacture, formulate, and deliver these new living medicines. And one thing that's not on this slide is we need all of you, we need natural history studies, we need to understand the diseases. Aside from the wonderful funding that you provide for our um, outstanding researchers, um, we need to understand the diseases and what's really important to you to make a difference in what aspect of the disease. And so that really takes teamwork and teamwork um, with all of you as well as with the scientists and MDs. I'm extremely lucky to work with uh, brilliant people at UC Davis. Um, some of them are at this uh, table over here, uh, Dr. Siegel, Dr. Fink. Um, I believe Dr. Silverman is at home and will be virtual because she has a broken arm right now. Um, and also uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Abedi, and they will be, t th these um, amazing colleagues of mine will all be uh, speaking and in panels um, later today. So you'll hear from them. So, when most people hear UC Davis, they think of, oh, it's an ag school, so why are we doing all this science? We're, we're actually in um, Sacramento, the state capital, uh, not actually in Davis. You can see Davis at the bottom. There are a lot of cows and green fields. We're, we're in a, uh, the, a big city. And uh, in Sacramento, we have uh, beautiful buildings. We work a lot with the uh, UC Davis uh, Mind Institute. Whoops, that wasn't the one. This was the speaker. The UC Davis Mind Institute had been shown at the bottom there, and that's um, an entire building and whole uh, infrastructure, infrastructure and program for um, children with neurodevelopmental um, differences. So we have, um, I work in the Institute for Regenerative Cures. It's a big building, and we have um, funding for uh, facilities, team training, and research from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. That's our state stem cell funding agency. Uh, NIH private donors, California State, and foundations such as the wonderful FAST. So we um, currently have 48 cell and gene therapy clinical trials ongoing. We have just completed two of them and over 20 in the pipeline. You can see the different um, teams there. There will not be a quiz on this later, just to show you the breadth of what we do. And the one um, most important to us here is the uh, neural team uh, working on Angelman and also the uh, hematopoietic stem cell therapy working on Angelman. The green arrows are where we have the clinical trials ongoing, and the red ones, we are um, currently working with the Food and Drug Administration to start the clinical trial. We're very fortunate to have this good manufacturing practice facility, and this is a clean room facility. We do the cellular product manufacturing for the clinical trials that have US FDA approvals. It's one of the largest academic GMP facilities in the United States. We have six um, different suites, and um, we manufacture cell and gene therapy products for many uh, academic and industry partners and work on many different diseases. 
So this is what the development and uh, working toward a clinical trial looks like. Um, we start things in the shared translational lab. That's an incubator for clinical trials. The basic translational and preclinical research is ongoing there. Um, our different uh, Angelman teams have translational research and preclinical research ongoing currently. Once we get the um, approval, the uh, FDA approval here, we submit what's called an investigation new drug application. It's a whole bunch of paperwork to the FDA. And then uh, they will let us start the phase one clinical trial. This is for safety. Um, small number of uh, patients, usually about 20. And then we go on to the phase two, larger number of patients, and that often has a placebo control. Uh, the placebo control for rare diseases can be standard of care. Um, and then the uh, phase three clinical trial is a large uh, multi-institutional trial. So we were um, lucky to be awarded a startup over three years to create the UC Davis Gene Therapy Center, and this was through the IMPACT program from the Office of Research. So that has further um, helped our, our uh, infrastructure that I'm describing to you today. So I mentioned the viral vectors. Um, you're probably all very familiar with the AAV vectors. You've been hearing about those. Um, we also use lentiviral vectors. This is for the cell therapy. So with the lentiviral vectors, um, cells such as the bone marrow stem cells will be removed from the patient. They're modified in the GMP facility. Um, we add the vector to those cells. It'll integrate. And then those cells are returned um, corrected to the patient. The uh, AAV vectors can be delivered into the brainstream, bloodstream, brainstream, <laughs> into the bloodstream or into a target tissue like the brain, and can be delivered directly. This is another way to look at it. We either have the direct delivery or the cell-based delivery, where we take the cells out, they go to that clean room facility and get modified, and then injected back. This is showing liver, but they can also go uh, intrathecally for the brain or uh, directly into the brain depending on the type of cell. And this is showing more of um, the uh, gene delivery to the uh, central nervous system using the AAV9, and I believe you'll hear it later from, uh, about, a lot about this from Jim Wilson, Dr. Jim Wilson. So we do large-scale viral vector manufacturing in our facility. We use these uh, automated machines and, um, and uh, they're hollow fiber bioreactors, and that's a lot, that allows us to make big batches. And we love these machines because they actually ping you on your cell phone if they need anything <laughs> added to them. So they're very cool. And we currently have um, 19 of these uh, bioreactors. So to manufacture um, cells or uh, viral vectors for clinical trials. So that's what it looks like inside the GMP facility in the, in the um, bioreactor room. Just to make sure that everyone's on the same page with the stem cells, there are two types. There are the pluripotent stem cells. These are the embryonic or the induced pluripotent stem cells that we make from a little um, sample of the child's um, skin fibroblasts. And then the somatic or tissue-specific stem cells. So today I'll talk about hematopoietic stem cells, modifying those, and uh, mesenchymal stem cells for delivery of gene editing um, molecules that uh, Dr. Kyle Fink's team is doing. So starting with the adult stem cells, the blood-forming or hematopoietic stem cells, these guys that look like little pearls here, um, they uh, are from the bone marrow or from the cord blood uh, collected after birth, or the patient can be given a, um, a reagent that will make them come out of the bone marrow and circulate, and then they can be collected, a, a mobilization agent. So we've had a lot of time to work on, uh, basically, bone marrow transplantation. Uh, I've been working in this field for 30 plus years. It's amazing that it's been that long, but um, the therapies began in 1956. I wasn't working on it quite then, but uh, soon after. <laughs> And by then, uh, hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved. Um, cord blood is now an option rather than bone marrow, and reduced intensity conditioning is available. So um, Dr. Abedi will be uh, speaking to you later about, um, I think he's in a panel, and we'll be speaking about the hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy that he and Dr. Anderson are developing for Angelman. Um, we actually have an outpatient clinic now 
for a bone marrow transplant that um, he's just opened. And so the patients get a, um, a drug um, a few days before to make some room in their bone marrow, and then they come in and get the cells and get watched for a couple of hours and go home. So it's really come a long, long way from um, how a bone marrow transplant used to be. And there's uh, Dr. Betty, and you'll hear, I'll, please direct your questions about bone marrow transplant to him because he is the expert. He runs our entire uh, BMT team at UC Davis. So this is what it looks like. This is the fascinating thing. In the bone marrow, we have these hematopoietic stem cells. They make every, um, every blood cell in your body. They also make the microglia that go to the brain. And that's where we can um, start having impact on um, disorders like Angelman or other disorders of the central nervous system. So with the bone marrow stem cell gene therapy, we take out the bone marrow or maybe cord blood when the baby's born. We add the viral vector with the um, correct gene that we'd like to be made throughout the patient's body and then infuse it. And the incredible thing about these cells is that um, for infusion, you just hook up an IV, they go back into the vein and they find their way into the bone marrow. And I've studied that for a lot of years. The mechanism by which they just know their way back home to the bone marrow is incredible really amazing cells. And so this is really what it looks like for a bone marrow transplant. So um, the cells are collected from the patient, the uh, blood stem cells are selected and purified, and then a working copy of the gene of interest is inserted into the cells using a viral vector. The um, corrected cells will be frozen or cryopreserved, and then the patient is um, conditioned, they get that agent that'll make some space in their bone marrow, um, get rid of some of their cells, and then the gene-corrected cells are infused. The amazing thing about these hematopoietic stem cells is after they go back into the patient's bone marrow, they will live there for the rest of the life of the patient and continue to make blood cells every, every day. So as um, Allison had mentioned, we started, I started this with uh, Don Cohn, started in this field um, back in the late 80s. We published this, the results of our first um, paper in uh, 95, that was our first clinical trial correcting um, baby, bubble babies so they're, they have an immune deficiency and they don't make an enzyme adenosine deaminase. And I worked with Don for 15 years of my career and then went off to have my own career and he kept working on this. So he has worked 30 years on this treatment and now um, 50 children born with this uh, rare disease can look forward to healthy lives and they, um, they are cured. So we don't use the word cure very often in science. We're very cautious. But this is a cure because these kids previously had to live a very isolated life. They were in, in um, isolation. Any virus or infection put, would put them at risk of death. And now they're out at school and swimming in public pools and they don't take any medication. So this is what we want for um, many other disorders. This is little Evie, who's one of the poster children for SCID and um, our state stem cell funding agency, CIRM, had um, funded that trial, so one of their things. So again, this is just showing um, mobilizing with the, with the agents, the growth factors that make the blood stem cells come out. We then isolate the stem cells, add the um, vectors, the transduced with the vector, and then um, culture them, and then uh, put them back into the patient. So you will hear about, um, you will hear later about the uh, stem cell therapy that um, Drs. Anderson and Abedi are developing at UC Davis. And I just wanted to point out that this would be autologous hematopoietic stem cell therapy. So that means it's the patient's own bone marrow. Um, it will be corrected and given back to the patient. That means they won't reject it. Um, they won't have side effects, they won't have graft-versus-host disease, um, any of those other things that you um, hear about, you, you know, some of the, the side effects that you can hear about from a bone marrow transplant. And as I mentioned, the microglial cells in the brain come from these hematopoietic or blood-forming stem cells, and therefore the bone marrow transplant with gene therapy really has a chance to impact some diseases that affect the brain, and that's um, the platform uh, on which we are working. And so we're working on uh, these different diseases and very importantly, uh, Angelman syndrome. 
for hematopoietic stem cell gene therapies. And this is uh, Dr. Anderson, you'll see him later. He first um, presented here in 2018 about this, and thanks to your funding, this is now moving forward and uh, moving toward clinical trials. So thank you, thank you, thank you. This is his um, paper that his, his team just put out with um, doctors uh, Siegel and Fink, who are here, a functional rescue in an Angelman syndrome model following treatment with lentiviral vector transduced hematopoietic stem cells. So working very well in the uh, mouse model, and now time to move it forward. And again, they'll talk later. So currently, 87 uh, clinical trials listed in the United States for hematopoietic stem cells and gene therapy, so there's a lot of expertise to uh, rely on in this field. And at UC Davis, we're working on, um, several of our teams are working, working on this. So the next type that I wanted to mention, because you'll hear a lot about these, are the pluripotent cells. So they're embryonic stem cells. Those are from IVF, uh, extra fertilized eggs. They can make any tissue. And then there are the induced pluripotent stem cells that can really replace the hematopoietic, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> human embryonic stem cells. And these are from a little sample of adult skin. It's like uh, getting your ear pierced, little bio, bio specimen. Grow out the skin fibroblasts and make them into these induced pluripotent stem cells. And they match the patient's genetics. They can also make all tissues. So there's a huge amount of potential for these. This is what it looks like. We start with either uh, cord blood stem cells or skin fibroblasts. We add some genes to um, turn them back in time to where they're very, very primitive and they can become anything. They're kind of like teenagers. They can become anything. And um, they're induced pluripotent stem cells at that point. And then we uh, characterize, do a lot of sequencing. Someday we will uh, differentiate and transplant them into the patient. That's not yet, that's not what we're working on yet because the differentiated neurons don't integrate yet very well into the brain, but a lot of brilliant teams are working on that. Uh, what we use these for is to differentiate them into neurons and study disease in a dish from individual patients or individual groups of patients with a disorder. We um, can do drug testing and gene therapy and gene editing on those uh, cell lines. These are some beautiful neurons that come from those induced pluripotent stem cells in culture. That was, this was in, in collaboration with our Mind Institute and my lab. And we had um, used these previously to look at um, FEX TAS, uh, Fragile X premutation neurons. The children have seizures, and we found out that the neurons actually, the neurons from the kids' own cells made into iPSCs and then neurons actually mimic that um, seizure disorder and that we could add different drugs and, and stop the, um, the extended um, signaling that they were doing. So very interesting uh, way to use these. Uh, Dr. Kyle Fink, who's here, his team is working on uh, direct reprogramming of cells to the um, induced neurons and is always trying to improve this um, technology and to use it for um, testing. And again, um, you'll hear from Dr. Fink, Dr. Siegel, and Dr. Silverman um, later today with all of, these, all of these interesting things that they're doing. With the um, ESC and IPSC, we have uh, several teams um, working, doing clinical trials and working toward the clinical trials. And um, we have an interesting ongoing clinical trial with um, diabetes. So the cells are made into uh, pancreatic uh, beta cells, and they make insulin in response to the patient's uh, needs for uh, the patient's glucose load. And um, this is with the company Viasite, and they have just reported that um, it's actually um, effective in the early phase trials. So a lot of potential from those cells, something to watch. And right now we're using them to learn, mostly. So the last half I wanted to mention is the mesenchymal or supporting cells. Those are the broad, flat cells in the background. They're also in the bone marrow. They nurture the hematopoietic stem cells. Um, we call them the paramedics of the body. They um, have a long safety record in clinical trials. Um, they home in on sick and dying cells. They're immunologically privileged, so we can transplant them from one patient to the other. They regulate inflammation, secrete factors. And importantly, they can be easily and safety in, safely engineered to transfer molecules, proteins, and organelles such as mitochondria. And um, 
Dr. Fink's team is using them to deliver gene editing uh, platforms. So they are a good candidate for delivery of gene editing tools. Um, they do secrete neurotrophic factors. Um, they can be readily engineered. They don't require immune suppression, strong safety profile, and um, there's demonstrated delivery of intracellular contents to neurons and other target cells. So these are the, um, the MSCs in red, uh, labeled in red here, and there are some damaged cells in green. And you can see that these, there are these little kind of red balls floating around, and the um, MSCs will deliver into the sick green cells, and then the green cells will just um, snap up those contents that's happening right here in this little GIF. And so that's um, the MSC giving things out of its own self uh, to help the other cells and to say, hey, you look sick, something's wrong here, let me just put this into you. So they can either transfer these, these microparticles or exosomes or um, they can directly deliver through nanotubules. And so this is cell-to-cell -cell communication. This is happening in everybody's body all the time. You get a little skin wound, you get some little infarct or something. The MSCs go there, they go into action, they're the paramedics, and they transfer things into the sick cells. So this is showing um, mitochondria actually transferring into these cells uh, via the nanotubules. And it's kind of like opening a gas hose into the other cell and just pouring stuff in, fascinating cells. And so I um, actually wrote the book on genetic engineering of uh, MSCs, and they can be very easily genetically engineered to produce um, protein and other factors for delivery to uh, target cells and tissues in the body, including uh, sick neurons. So what we do when we're manufacturing these cells in the GMP facility, we get normal bone marrow from a healthy donor. It doesn't have to be that person's because it, it can be um, transplanted without immunologic matching. We grow them up uh, following standard operating procedures in the GMP facility. That's a big stack of papers and you follow it to the letter um, for manufacturing cells. We then engineer them to produce the gene editing molecules uh, with the expertise of Kyle Fink's awesome lab. And we then would freeze them um, and wait for the clinical trial. And so uh, Kyle's lab is working on um, Angelman syndrome as well as other platforms um, for gene editing, and uh, including MSC delivery and AAV and other types of uh, nanoparticles. So this is showing some work from his lab, where the bone marrow MSCs are expressing the gene editing proteins that have an M cherry label. And we want these gene editing proteins to go into the neurons and fix the broken gene, basically. Just fix it and then leave. Um, the full-length targeting protein is being made. This is a delivery into the mouse brain. You can see that they're pretty good spread on that side. He has um, published this uh, in in vivo cell-based delivery platform for zinc finger artificial transcription factors and preclinical animal models for uh, gene modification. This includes the MSCs. And this is um, in young rhesus monkeys. Their paper was just accepted. Congratulations, Dr. Fink. Uh, Dr. Peter Deng, who's an outstanding postdoc with us, with uh, Cal's lab, is the lead author on this. And it's um, in collaboration with our primate facility at UC Davis. And this is showing intrathecal, or into the uh, spinal cord, uh, administration of MSCs in young rhesus monkeys, um, and showing that the cells are there, and the uh, protein of interest is being made in the midbrain uh, CSF fluid and uh, in the cervical region. So please ask him questions about that. <laughs> And this is just their um, stem cell and gene therapy for CNS disorders uh, platform. So identify uh, the disorder. And by the way, he works on other things as well as Angelman's. Um, big focus on Angelman's, thanks to all your funding. But what we learn from every rare disease and what we learn about delivery to the brain um, works, works for all diseases. It really is a platform. So identify the uh, disorder get the patient sample, um, the iPSCs, genetic info, design the gene modifier, um, make these induced neurons, uh, differentiate them, uh, develop these uh, in, in different in vitro models to study the cells, um, do the targeting and the modification to, to uh, 
cause the gene of interest to be expressed and then delivered to the CNS. And as I'd mentioned, he's working on AAV um, particles and also cell-based cell delivery, uh, MSC-based delivery, and then um, animal models of the disease and hopefully uh, clinical trials in the future. And here's his one picture of his team. It changes, he has so many trainees, but it's a great, great team to work with. And I'm very fortunate to be in the same uh, shared translational lab with them, so I get to see all of their enthusiasm and vitality every day. I love it. And again, um, they will be speaking later, so please um, look for that. So in summary, there are several therapeutic stem cell and gene therapy options that I spoke about today. Gene therapy is adding a normal copy to re restore function. Uh, the hematopoietic stem cell cells are currently best for long-term therapy. Cell replacement strategies, um, transplantation of healthy progenitors capable of differentiation into the tissue of interest. This in the future may be transplantation of gene-modified patient iPSC-derived cells, but this is really still very much in the scientific phase. We use cells for tissue healing, promoting angiogenesis and neurogenesis. Um, MSCs secrete those factors that promote healing over inflammation and scarring. They're easily gene modified. And then we also use the MSCs um, to carry cargo for gene modification and correction. So silencing or gene editing or adding back a gene um, for a dominant mutant allele, um, that can all happen with the MSCs uh, carrying cargo. And those, that's very much under study. We're very much uh, helped with all of this by our alpha stem cell clinic and that is funded by our California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Um, let's see. We, uh, <laughs> these, these are complicated big trials. There are so many teams involved, and we have a big spread out campus in Sacramento. So we're down here in the Institute for Regenerative Cures, and we're delivering to the uh, neurology clinic that's here, and our um, outpatient clinic for uh, bone marrow transplant that's here. And we have a stem mobile to deliver the cells. So. Very happy to have that. We used to lug these liquid nitrogen doers across campus, and now it's really good to have this, this dem mobile. So uh, Dr. Abedi, who you'll hear from later, is the, uh, the principal investigator of our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, and they help um, different clinical trial units with different um, aspects of the clinical trials that are needed. And then we have the GMP facility, the Quality Control Testing Lab, the Quality Assurance Unit, they will manufacture and certify the cell and gene therapy products. They produce the batch records, formulate, perform the release criteria testing, sign off on the products. And then the um, cell and gene therapy specialists in our alpha stem cell clinic get to deliver the cells over to the clinic via the stem mobile. And when it's a clinical trial that we're very excited about, everybody comes out of the institute and cheers when the stem mobile takes off with the cells. <laughs> We just did a clinical trial for a spina bifida for a baby still in the womb, and we had like 50 people out there cheering, and went well, we're hoping. And then we follow the patients with telehealth. We have a huge uh, telehealth program at UC Davis and at all of the other um, University of California and City of Hope that are in this Alpha Clinic network, and we really help each other with all of the clinical trials. So my final slide, um, in this new era of medicine, uh, cell and gene therapies are being prescribed to treat diseases and injuries. Um, there's a list of them here. We're committed to training the healthcare providers of the future. This is a different way to look at medicine. And um, it takes these teams, everything that I've described to you, it takes teams. And thank you to our entire team. This is one of our Monday morning um, lab meetings, group meetings before the pandemic, where we didn't have to wear masks and stuff. Um, it takes a lot of teamwork. Um, thank you so much to FAST. Thank you to all of you for the funding to be working toward these therapies that you're going to hear more specifics about later. Um, this has really been an incredible journey. So I'm on Twitter. I like to tweet um, highlights of things um, going on. And that is my last slide. So with that, I can take questions. Thank you. Don't be shy. I know you have questions because you're going to ask them to me later. <laughs> you want to? We have wipes for the microphone, so I'm going to make someone do that that has a wipe, so you don't get my my COVID. Oh. Looks like Christy's got it. <laughs> I gotta hold it. Come on. 
Um, with res regard to the stem cells and cord blood, I assume it's only the patient's cord blood and not a sibling's? Yes, that's a good point. Well, the sibling might be matched, actually. Siblings have a good chance to be matched. Um, the, the parent would not be a match. Um, well, anyway, the, um, the cord blood has like a, a decent chance to match from a sibling. Um, uh, people have asked, can we use the cord blood from the child for a parent? And that's not a match. But if, if it's the same two parents and they have, um, say, four kids, um, there's a good chance that one of the kids could be a match if the cord blood has been saved. Is there any benefit of cord blood versus uh, bone marrow? It would really, for, for the clinical trial that we're planning, um, it would only be the patient's bone marrow because that's the best match and there's no chance of rejection. So, but, you know, we run a, a big cord blood collection program and that's, that's also an amazing, it's an amazing resource to have the cord blood um, banked from very diverse population to be, a bit, to be available, so, also cool. Hi. Thank you so much. I, I, all I have to say is wow. I was just so impressed with all this amazing research. My question is, on one of the slides it said that it's likely that we will require combination treatments. My question is why? Oh, that, yeah, that slide was just pointing out um, the autologous versus allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And so that was really um, targeted toward um, transplantation for cancer. So it wasn't specifically tailored for the gene therapy. I just pulled it out of the deck to show um, autologous, meaning the patient's own, and some of the benefits. Thank you. Thank you for honing in on that and asking. <laughs> I was actually thinking of putting a block over that, and then I thought, no, that's going to look really silly. <laughs> yeah. For the, for the plant therapy, it would be the patient's own bone marrow. The gene is added, and it goes back. And, Dr. Betty will answer all the questions about that because he's the world expert. Hi. You, you, you brought up biocide. As an example of yeah. cell therapy, successful yeah. cell therapy in diabetes. Yeah. Um, but biocide themselves wouldn't commit to the cells being beta cells. It's some insulin secreting cells. <laughs> right. They, yeah. they, so when you beta like do, cells. Yeah. Right. So when you do stem cells and deliver these cells, how would you know that these are becoming cells that are normal or, or that belong there, integrated well, as opposed to some cell type that can't be is not characterizable or yeah. won't exist in, in normal situations? That is an outstanding question, and that's why we're not currently planning clinical trials for neural disorders with the induced pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells. So we can differentiate them into neurons, but there are always a few other cells, and they're neuron-like cells. We don't know that they have the function and they can have the signal transduction. They're great for disease in a dish and to study and to do all the wonderful gene editing that the Fink Lab's doing and see that the, the gene can be corrected, um, genes can be um, upregulated. Um, but we're not, we're not currently planning to put the iPSC-derived neurons into the brain just for that question. Um, the hematopoietic stem cells, I guess I, I could have explained a little more. The, the adult stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells and the mesenchymal stem cells, they don't spuriously become something else. The hematopoietic stem cells make all the lineages of the blood, but they would never become a liver cell or become a vascular cell or a brain cell. They will make blood cells, they will make microglia that will go to the blood, to the brain. Um, but they are locked into that, those types of programs of differentiation. So they're not going, we know that they're hematopoietic stem cells. And over the past um, 30 plus years, we've shown that we can put the vectors into them and they're still stem cells and they still engraft and they still make all of the blood cells and microglia. So that's the difference between the adult stem and progenitor cells and the, um, these new pluripotent stem cells that are still very much in study and have all the potential in the world, but we're just not planning clinical trials with them quite yet. The, the viocide is, is the first, um, I think, success in, in that area and the first um, clinical trial that we've been doing with the embryonic stem cells.
Great question. Uh, you mentioned that the cord cells had to come from a sibling. Uh, is there opportunity at all for the stem cells to come further down in the family tree, like say a uh, nephew or niece or something like that? There might be a match. Um, it, it's difficult to get a match for bone marrow transplantation, and that would be the allogeneic transplantation, so not from the patient themselves. Um, we have these things called human leukocyte antigens on the surface of the cells, and you really need a, a five out of six match. So you get three from your mom and three from your dad. You need a five out of six match to have it be a healthy engraftment and that the cells would live and not cause any type of problems. And it's really just kind of slim. So for the, either for the, for the bone marrow harvest uh, from a child or for mobilization of the cells from a child, it's really not that difficult. It sounds scary. Um, but uh, the patient is sedated and a needle goes through the back of the iliac crest and gets some bone marrow. And um, it, we have, you know, we, we pay donors $200 to have it done and they don't, they don't complain, they think that's worth it. So um, it, it's not as traumatic as, as you might think to have the bone marrow drawn. I haven't particularly have it done because I'm a cancer patient and I can't donate to anybody, but I haven't had it done myself. But, um, Others report that it's, um, the tailbone's just sore for like a day and then they're okay. And of course a child would be, um, would be under a, a, a local sedation.